Thank you. Francis, I'm delighted to ask you to address Congress. Congress, welcome our General Secretary. Thank you very much to our fantastic president. Thank you, Sally. Uh, I'm formally moving the General Counsel statement on collective bargaining. And my thanks to you, delegates, uh, to the General Counsel and to all our unions. Now, as we know from Sally's speech 150 years ago, unions met in a small room in the Mechanics Institute. And here we are, we're back in Manchester still fighting for working people with the same belief we're stronger together and that same spirit of hope and determination. Let's also be proud of our contribution to other great causes that we're celebrating. 70 years of our wonderful NHS. Ninety years since all women got the right to vote. And 100 years since the birth of Nelson Mandela. Now, he led people on that long road to freedom. And I'm proud, we should all be proud, that the global trade union movement born in Manchester backed him every step of the way. Now, this seems to be the year of anniversaries because, of course, 30 years ago, Jacques Delors gave his famous address to our Congress. 1988, the year Kylie Minogue topped the charts with her song, I Should Be So Lucky. Lucky, lucky, lucky. <laughs> Funnily enough, we weren't feeling it. Then, as now, we were under a Tory government and the Prime Minister was rolling out the red carpet for another American president. You remember him well, Ronald Reagan. The original warmongering, anti-trade union, B-list celebrity president. But Jacques Delors offered us something different. He spoke about peace in Europe and plans to boost trade. That mattered for jobs. And he encouraged us to become architects in a new plan for better working lives. So over time, alongside our friends in Europe, we won paid leave for working parents, stronger equal pay rights for women, pensions for part-timers, and at long last, one of the first ever goals of our movement, paid holidays for everyone. Now, countries don't have to belong to the European Union to be in the single market. But if they want to trade inside the market, every worker must get these rights. They are the rock that national laws and union agreements are built on. But now we face Brexit in exactly 200 days. This country needs a deal that works for working people, but frankly, there's no sign of that. As they stand, the Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's Chequers proposals won't get past Brussels or Westminster. And if she believes, if she really believes that an agreement with the EU can be signed and delivered by November, then she's either fooling herself or she's trying to fool the British people. The risk of crashing out is real. Now, Theresa May says, and I quote her, no deal wouldn't be the end of the world. Now, I think most people would like the bar set a little higher than that. And frankly, it's cold comfort for the millions of people whose jobs are on the line. Now, of course, for wealthy Tory MPs like, I don't know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, no deal is the holy grail. On planet Mogg, uh, 50 years of hardship is a small price to pay. But then again, he won't be paying it. 
So the TUC is clear. We want a Brexit deal that protects working people, not just the well-to-do in the posh parts of Surrey and not just the City of London or big business either, but a deal for the people who are the backbone of this country. All along, we've said that we're open to any deal that protects workers' jobs and rights and peace in Northern Ireland. That's what most people want. Decent livelihoods, dignity at work, the kind of country where their children get a better life than they did. And that's what we want too. But the stark reality is this. If we crash out, or if we end up with one of those CETA-style deals, trade barriers will go up. That means it's more expensive to make things here. Companies move factories abroad and investors look elsewhere. Bang go good jobs, up go prices, and Dover becomes one big lorry park. So this is what needs to happen next. The PM needs to be straight with us about how her deal would hit jobs. And she needs to serve notice that we need an extension to Article 50 so instead, we can negotiate the deal that workers need. This isn't about delaying Brexit. It's about leaving the EU on the right terms, where jobs and rights come first. And if she won't do it, or if her party won't let her, well, then I'm serving notice on the Prime Minister. If you come back with a deal that doesn't put workers first, and if you won't call a general election, then I'm warning you, we'll throw our full weight behind a campaign and demand that the terms of the deal are put to a popular vote. <laughs> After all, we're the movement that fought for the vote for working class people. And we know that democracy belongs to all of us. And when it comes to our future, one way or another, people must have a say. Because we've had 10 long years of wage freezes, cuts and austerity. And the stakes are very high. Now, the poet, as people will know, my favourite poet, Seamus Heaney, wrote that when human beings suffer, they get hurt and they get hard. That's what the far right want to exploit. Stirring up division, spreading hate. Some politicians have warned of violence on the streets. Well, I've got news for them. It's already happening. Since the referendum two years ago, there's been a shocking rise in attacks by far right thugs against Muslims and Jewish people, against gay and disabled people, and against migrant workers too. Look at Tommy Robinson's gang, recruiting on the terraces, rampaging through our streets, targeting trade unionists. And this isn't the 1930s or the 1970s. This time, they're not just organizing on the streets, they're mobilizing on Facebook and WhatsApp, aided and abetted by Russian hackers, paid for by American billionaires. And when neo-fascists threaten public order and peace, we don't retreat. We don't let them intimidate us. Our response must be more democracy, not less. And I want to say this, any self-serving politician who flirts with the far right is playing with fire. Let me be clear, let me be clear. A woman who wears a niqab or a burqa is still our sister. And 
we defend, we defend the right of Muslim women and all women to wear whatever they want. So I want to say this to Boris Johnson. We see you. We know what you're about. We know exactly what buttons you're pushing. But our movement will always call out those who dog whistle racism. So Boris Johnson, shame on you. And delegates, here's another prejudice that needs nailing, which I'm fed up, up about. From the far right rich men, they claim to champion the interests of blue collar workers, but they don't. It may suit them to try and stereotype everyone who's white and working class as a racist, but they're wrong. The great majority are decent men and women Look at the trade union movement. Whatever our nationality, race or religion, we stand together as workers. And we will keep speaking up for common decency. Because this movement's mission is to unite working people. And we can stop the far right in its tracks. So here's what we'll do. First, we'll mobilize our members. Trade unions bring people together. We build friendships and communities. There are nearly six million of us, and our members are the most powerful force we have. Now, we're not in denial. We know we've got work to do on attitudes about anti-Semitism, immigration, Islam. So first, we will get behind our workplace reps so they feel confident to counter far-right views and build a bulwark against them. Second, we need Parliament to wake up and take urgent action. And that means new rules to take big overseas money out of our politics, not just at election time, but for good. It means tough new duties on social media giants to stop the spread of hate. And yes, it must mean a new deal for working people too. Because it's true, our hospitals are understaffed and waiting lists are too long. It's true that school staff are overworked and classes are too big. And it's true that too often our kids can't find an affordable home or a decently paid steady job. But we don't blame Poles or Romanians. We don't blame Muslims and we don't blame migrants. We blame a Tory government that is bankrupting public services. We blame tax dodging transnational companies too greedy to pay their fair share. And we blame bad bosses always on the lookout for cheap labour undercutting wages and driving decent employers out of business. So today, let's pledge that we'll organise working people into movements in towns across the country. And we'll work with unions in Europe and internationally too to demand decent jobs, homes and public services and stop racist scapegoating once and for all. And wherever the far right marches or tries to attack mosques or synagogues, the trade union movement will be there, defending our communities, standing firm. Let's send the message, delegates. Let's send that message. They will not pass. But all the while, we will keep our eyes on the future and tackle the root causes of hate and win that better life that working people deserve. Right now, we're living through a time of rapid industrial disruption. Capital is grabbing more and more of the gains and labor is shortchanged. But as new tech grows, everyone should get richer. 
productivity gains from artificial intelligence alone could be worth £200 billion. If even half of those promised gains are true, then we can afford to make it happen. Now, as ever, we demand fair shares. That means higher wages, less time at work, more time with our loved ones. Now, in the 19th century, unions campaigned for an eight-hour day. In the 20th century, we won the right to a two-day weekend and paid holidays. So for the 21st century, let's lift our ambition again. I believe that in this century, we can win a four-day working week with decent pay for everyone. Let's take back control of our working time, ban zero hours, win two-way flexibility and end exploitation once and for all. Because it's time to share the wealth and stop the greed. Take Jeff Bezos. Now he runs Amazon, now a trillion dollar company. He's the richest man in the world. He's racking up the billions but his workers are collapsing on the job. Ambulance is called because staff are exhausted. Workers are afraid to go sick in case they get disciplined. Camping out because pay won't stretch to cover the cost of transport. Britain today, you bet we need strong unions and we want the right to go into every workplace, starting with those warehouses. You know, Amazon's company motto, I looked this one up, Amazon's company motto is work hard, have fun, make history. Well, let me say to Amazon and all those other companies that exploit workers, that's exactly what our union organizers intend to do. Brothers and sisters, we're at a, com a crossroads and the political choices that we make now will determine our future. Used for good, technology can protect the planet from climate change, help advances in healthcare, make working lives richer and better. But we know there are risks too. No one needs to tell this movement what happens when a company goes bust overnight, when there's no help for industries to upgrade or for workers to retrain. We know how much that hurts people, people used to respect and a decent standard of living, treated like nobodies, abandoned, on the scrap heap. And we can't let bosses make working life worse tracking and timing workers every move, snooping on what staff say in their own time on Facebook and Instagram, sweating them with impossible targets set by computer. But trade unionists are optimists. We've won this battle before and we can do it again. Win a share of the wealth, stop Big Brother surveillance and negotiate new technology agreements so people can move smoothly into the jobs of the future. Because if we want a more equal Britain, collective bargaining is a big part of the solution. Let's agree that every worker should have the right to a collective voice. Let's have an obligation on employers to bargain with us in good faith. And let's deliver a tech revolution that benefits the whole country. But we need a government that wants to work with us, not one obsessed with its own party power games, when they should be focused on the real lives of the people that they're supposed to serve. Franklin D. Roosevelt, he was the architect of the original New Deal. He took over as American president years into the Great Depression. And he spoke of the despair when a nation looks to government, but
but the government looks away. Well, today in Britain, we have exactly such a hear-nothing, see-nothing, do-nothing government. Theresa May stood on the steps of Downing Street promising to help the just about managing. Remember that? But two years later, nothing. Nothing to stop universal credit cuts, nothing to get wages rising, nothing on zero hours contracts, nothing on building council homes, and nothing for the Windrush generation. What's this government's plan to help working people? Absolutely nothing. Now, I believe it's time for change. We need a better government than this one. Working people deserve a better government than this one. So I want to end with this message to the Prime Minister. If you can't deliver a Brexit that protects jobs and rights, if you can't invest in our NHS, our schools and our public services, if you won't put the railways, water, Royal Mail back into public hands where they belong, if you won't build a country where we can live in peace with our neighbours and where right across the nation people get fair shares, if you won't give us the New Deal that working people demand, Mrs May, stand down. Stand down, Theresa, and take your do-nothing government with you. Give us a general election, and we will do everything in our power to elect a new Prime Minister and a new government that will. Thank you, delegates. Happy 150th. Stay strong. Here's to the next 150.